Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 25th, 2014, and my guest is James Otteson, Executive Director of the BB&T Center for the Study of Capitalism and a Teaching Professor of Political Economy at Wake Forest University. His latest book, The End of Socialism, is the topic for our conversation today. Jim, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you very much, Russ. It's a pleasure to be with you. I want to start with a, a longish quote from the book, which I thought sets it up very nicely. Uh, and I get you to add anything to that before we get started into the substance. Um, here's what you say, and I, and I this is in, in a way is it's not the way you phrase it, but this is a in a way an explanation for why uh, you wrote a book called The End of Socialism. Uh, some people would say, well, there aren't really any socialists anymore, and right. and you have the following point very early on. It goes like this. <clears throat> Although few people call themselves socialists, a large proportion of people endorse policies and indeed a political worldview that is what I will call socialist inclined. Socialist inclined policy is that which tends to prefer centralized over decentralized economic decision making. It also tends to distrust granting local people or communities a wide scope to organize themselves according to their own lights, especially when their decisions conflict with larger preferred corporate or social goals. It tends to prize material equality over individual liberty and is willing to limit the latter in the service of the former. And it tends to hold that self-interest is either morally suspect or can be eradicated from or at least significantly diminished in human behavior by the proper arrangement of political, economic, and cultural institutions. A great number of people, regardless of party affiliation, fall somewhere along those continua in the directions of socialism. The argument of this book applies, therefore, to all those policies, beliefs, and positions that are socialist-inclined, even if not avowedly socialist. So your book is an attack not just on socialism per se, but this socialist uh, inclination, which I do agree with you, I think is very widely held. In fact, I would suggest it's in many ways perhaps the dominant uh, viewpoint of most Americans. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, it's it's true that uh, not many people call themselves socialists, and people define socialism in various ways. They define capitalism in various ways. But I was trying to look for a way to understand both of them such that, first of all, they're opposed, and they are in a, in a deep sense opposed, um, but also in a way that adherence to sort of both systems of political economy would accept. And I thought that the key to understanding the difference um, between the two systems of political economy really was this question of who makes the decisions. So who's making the uh, the relevant economic decisions? Is it um, a third party, a person, group, agency who's making it on behalf of others? Um, that's what I'm calling um, the, the impulse towards centralism. Um, or is it uh, principally individuals or uh, communities themselves, localized communities themselves? That's what I'm calling um, decentralized decision making. And, I th- and that is a spectrum. There's a spectrum between, um, you know, at, at the limit, um, on the one hand of the centralized version, you have a, a view that might be um, complete or full socialism where all economic decisions are made by a centralized group of people. Um, on the other hand, uh, you have a, at the limit where all economic decisions are made by, say, individuals. Um, but understanding um, the, the two systems in this way as uh, endpoints along this continuum, I think, is instructive in um, in placing our political landscape today um, and locating where policies or positions or individuals um, are on uh, on exactly this spectrum. Are they inclining more towards centralized decision-making or decentralized decision-making? And you set up a comparison uh, that really focuses on that, that I, and I think of it the same way. I think it's a – I think it's the central way to think about it. Is it top-down or is it bottom-up? And I'm – and I think you were also more of a bottom-up person. Um, You identify, though, in the book, you identify each of these views with two different uh, champions. For the socialist inclination, you use G.A. Cohen. And for the capitalist inclination, the bottom-up one, you use 
your friend and mine, Adam Smith. Why those two? And uh, and and of course, I want to emphasize as, as you just did implicitly, Adam Smith is not a uh, hardcore libertarian. Well, we'll talk later about his views on government, but he's definitely capitalist inclined. So why did you choose those two? Um, well, for a couple of reasons. I mean, um, take, take the easy one first. Uh, I think Adam Smith is the, is the natural person to select for the decentralized or the capitalist system of political economy, not only because history has, and I think rightly, conceived of him as being sort of the father of, um, of a market economy, a commercial society, um, but also in many ways, I think, um, and I think you may share this judgment, um, his analysis is perhaps the most sophisticated, both on the uh, level of moral philosophy um, and on the level of what we would now think of as, uh, as uh, pure economics. Um, so I think he's a natural choice, and people associate him and his tradition with the capitalist tradition. So I think he was the natural choice for that. Um, for the centralized um, system of political economy, uh, you, you might initially think that the, the counterpoint to Smith should be Karl Marx. Um, and I had considered Marx, but um, the problem with Marx, I think, um, it's if too we're easy for this purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he has a lot of metaphysical baggage, as I would call. There are a lot of a lot of uh, metaphysical assumptions that are somewhat complicated and um, and difficult to sort through. Um, that would, if I took him as my paradigm, I'd have to spend a lot of time sorting through a lot of his uh, rather tortuous prose. Um, and I thought that would distract from um, from the the point of the discussion. G.A. Cohen, um, whose uh, book that just came out a few years ago called uh, Why Not Socialism with a question mark, um, in some sense, his, so he is a life, he was a lifelong, he's recently deceased, he was a lifelong socialist, um, spent a lot of his career defending in one way or another um, socialist or socialist inclined political philosophy against um, market or capitalist inclined political uh, philosophy. Um, and he's a sophisticated thinker and quite an influential one. So um, I thought he would be a good uh, counterpoint and a good paradigm to take. Yeah, I didn't know his work until uh, I read your book as, as well as another book you recently uh, edited that came out called What Adam Smith Knew, which is uh, an, a reader of both defenders and opponents of capitalism. And Cohen, uh, you excerpt from that book you mentioned of Cohen's. Right, uh, and it's uh, it's quite provocative, and we're gonna we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Cohen's approach. And I was sorry to say that he passed away for obviously because it's always sad when someone dies, but also because I was hoping to interview him on Econ Talk. So um, <laughs> that's not going to happen now. So we're going to have to have a conversation about some of his claims. I'm going to start with one uh, that you quote. You say he claims that socialism envisions human life as based on quote communal reciprocity close quote which he defines as an, quote, anti-market principle, according to which I serve you, not because of what I can get in return by doing so, but because you need or want my service, and you, for the same reason, serve me. Uh, right. It's a lovely idea. What's wrong with it? Well, um, I mean, in, in some ways, and, and at first blush, and maybe even at second blush, um, it doesn't sound all that different, actually, from what goes on um, in market exchanges, as might be conceived by Adam Smith. I mean, when you think about the, the famous passage from Smith about the butcher, the brewer, and the baker, that we address ourselves not to their humanity, um, or we, we don't ask them to take pity on us or, to, um, uh, or for purposes of charity to trade with us, but rather we address ourselves to, the, to their self-love or their self-interest. Um, what that means for Smith is that you're, when you're going to exchange with another person who has the, um, the right and opportunity to say no thank you if they would like to go somewhere else, um, you really have to focus yourself on uh, not what you want, but rather on what they want. Um, and that notion of a kind of uh, communal reciprocity, to take Cohen's term, um, is built in, I think, and properly understood into the kind of market exchange that Smith is talking about. Um, but for Cohen, what um, what he envisions is um, what I what I call um, a um, or what I would call a, um, a criterion of mere need. So if I need something or if I want something, that and if you have that thing, whatever it is that I need or I want, uh, for Cohen, that suffices um, as a justification for your not only giving it to me, but maybe even being required to give it to me. And the problem that I see with that, one of the problems, there, there might be others, but one of the problems I see with that is that I don't think that that gives proper respect to you. Because you, after all, have uh, limited, like everybody else, you have scarce resources 
Um, you have various things that you might put your resources toward. You have your own schedule of value, your own purposes in life. Um, and if my need or my want is sufficient to trigger and maybe even to demand that you provide for me something that you have, then that disrespects and indeed doesn't even pay any attention to whatever other needs, goals, purposes that you yourself are serving. So it's as if my needs trump yours, which in my view makes it um, not an equality of uh, human agency, but rather um, a my, mind being superior to yours. Um, and I think that runs afoul of a very deep uh, moral principle that I see in Smith, which is um, an argument in favor of an equality of moral agency. Each person um, deserves respect as a moral agent. And part of what that means is that each person has the right to sometimes say no thank you and go somewhere else. If all that's required for, uh, um, in, order to, uh, in order to demand or command an exchange is for one person to need or want something, then that really subjects the other party to the whims or needs or, um, or uh, wants of the, uh, of the first party. Um, and that, I think, violates that moral principle of equality of moral agency. So the challenge, of course, is – and let's get to one of the harder cases right away. Um, let's take uh, my children. So my children have uh, certain incredible advantages that are well above uh, the average person's. Some of those are genetic. They have some genetic handicaps too, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the advantages they – have, they have a lot of advantages. They, they grow up in a house. They have grown up in a house that has – Lots of books. They've grown up in a house where parents pushed education. Um, they've grown up in a house that's that's well above the, the median, and so they have certain expectations for their own uh, financial success. Uh, some of that I think is unfortunate, but that they're there. So my children are likely to be. They may not be, but they are likely to be very successful in in, in the financial sense. They may not be happy. Uh, they may have other all kinds of challenges. But they're unlikely to be poor. They have a natural advantage that, that just came from being born in my house. They didn't choose it. They didn't earn it. Uh, they still have to earn some of, of course, what they, what they do with their life. They have to work hard, and there's a limit to what I can help them with. Um, but from the natural advantages I'm giving them, but they have certain advantages. Now, contrast that with some a child growing up in a different house. Maybe growing up with a single parent, going to a horrible school as opposed to the school my kids have been lucky enough to go to. And that child's going to grow up. Some of them will succeed despite those disadvantages. But on, it's likely that my children will be more successful than the children growing up in that, in that current uh, – in that household with, with poor schooling and, and difficult uh, family life. So to what extent then – is the moral agency of, of my children. My children may choose to help those those folks who are less well off than they are. But let's choose, let's suppose, I hope they do, but let's suppose they don't. Let's suppose they're selfish. Um, they don't want to help anybody else. They are uh, very self, not just self-interested, but, but selfish. And um, G.A. Cohen would say, and many others would say, uh, they have not earned the financial success that they, that they have. And they will have. And therefore, it's okay. It's appropriate. It is moral for the state to trump their moral agency, their decision not to aid poor people, and to take some of the uh, income that they have, I was going to say earned, but in fact, much of it they did not earn. It just came luckily to them. Uh, what's wrong with that argument? Um, well, there's a, there are a lot of assumptions built into that argument um, that I think um, need to be uh, parsed out. Um, first, a, a couple of things that you mentioned, but I want to emphasize. Uh, one is that one's background does not necessarily determine uh, one's um, achievement or outcome in life. So there are plenty of stories of people who had very privileged backgrounds and turned out not to be particularly successful in life. Um, and the reverse is true, too. There are plenty of people who didn't have very privileged backgrounds, but, it, but turned out uh, through dint of uh, some combination of hard work or luck um, to, uh, to achieve very highly in life. So... Um, so the first thing to emphasize is that one's background doesn't actually determine what happens um, to a person. Although, um, to your point, which is really the, the strongest part of what you're, of this objection, um, it certainly, at least arguably, has a large effect. Um, so when we get to evaluating people's relative success in life, 
some portion of that, uh, certainly, and I think this is your point, some portion of that is attributable not to the actual agency work choices that individuals made, but to circumstances that they had, lucky or unlucky. And you mentioned uh, this throughout the book. You're not, I'm not suggesting you didn't, uh, that you're blind to it, of course. It's a, it's a major issue. It's, it, it is a major issue, and, um, and no book on uh, uh, evaluating the, the merits of socialism would be complete without addressing that squarely. Um, so, um, the, so th that's the first point to make, that um, one's background doesn't necessarily determine uh, outcomes in life. Um, but there's a practical and a moral issue also that I would raise. First, the practical issue. The practical issue is the conclusion of, your, of the way you stated the objection is um, um, shouldn't the state step in? Maybe even, in fact, is the state morally required to step in to try to equalize maybe the starting points of people um, – um, so that the, that the unchosen background, whether that's genes, education, family life, et cetera, the unchosen part of their background that affects their life outcomes, that that's equalized to some extent. Shouldn't the state step in? Well, the assumption, the practical, um, the practical issue that I would raise with that is that there's a very large assumption built there, and that is that the state can do that. So it's one thing to say, um, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the world be better if people started off with something like a relatively equal uh, footing? It's an altogether separate question to say, well, um, what can third parties, including uh, government parties, do to actually effectuate that? And a lot of the argument that I make in the first half of the book is, um, is really exploring that in detail because it turns out that um, there are a lot of difficulties involved in going from the intention to the result in trying to actually get from uh, we would like to uh, – this, this intended result of we would like to have people have relatively equal um, starting points to what are the uh, what's the political machinery that we have at our disposal and how likely is it that it will actually effectuate this and in fact what you see um, when you you don't have to look very hard but what you see is a lot of the 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 actual programs agencies policies that uh, that are proposed or that are in um, in existence now attempting to um, to satisfy some of these intentions. Um, oftentimes are not as ex are not very effective, and in fact, many times are actually counterproductive. So there's a very large question about what we're actually able to do, aside from what we might intend to do. Um, but the other part about it, uh, what, what I said is a um, the mo uh, a moral point that one might raise about this. Um, one of the consequences, I would say, of the Adam Smithian or if you like the capitalist um, uh, worldview of political economy, is that. Um, if you have a state, a state the, the state is, um, at least arguably, although some will argue against this, uh, the Smithian position is that the state is able to do um, some things very well, but a whole lot of things it can't do very well. And one of the things it can't do very well is, um, is collect the knowledge that's required um, to know exactly what kinds of things would be good for you. Um, Knowing what kinds of help um, a particular person or a particular family need in order to um, give their children, let's say, a, um, a good chance in life, that requires an intense personal familiarity with the person or the situation involved. And it's very difficult to, to gather that information from afar. Um, now, when I, say, when I call that a moral um, consideration, that sounds like a practical consideration, but it becomes a moral one in the following way. What that, what that means on the Smithian view and on the what I'm calling the capitalist, the capitalist inclined system of political economy, is that moral obligation falls on precisely the people who do have that knowledge. And that's typically localized individuals. In other words, on you and me. So when you and I see people, individuals, families, local communities, we become aware of people who, um, who could use some help. If we have some ability to provide some help, that obligation falls on us. It doesn't fall on a distant third party um, that arguably does not have the relevant knowledge to know what kinds of help would actually be help um, as opposed to what kinds of policies or redistributions or um, programs um, might be helpful, might not be helpful, might be counterproductive, et cetera. So the moral obligation then falls. It's, it's not that it goes away, that there's no moral obligation. Indeed, there is. And in fact, I would argue that, it's, that it becomes even more uh, robust because it falls on us as individuals. So I want to I want to agree with half of that. I want to disagree okay. with half and let you let you respond. So the half the part I disagree with is well, it's, it's a subtle point. I, I think it's not such a big knowledge problem as to what people need. 
especially if you take the socialist agenda on its face. Uh, what, one of the strangest things about to me about the socialist inclination is its materialist focus, its focus on material equality as opposed to flourishing. So what I find depressing about American life today isn't so much that there are a lot of people who, who struggle to succeed, although that's depressing. It's that their ability to enjoy life, to, to express oneself, to use one's talents is so limited among so many parts of the population because of the failure of the school system, because people have been, unfortunately, have spent 10 to 15, 10, well, some length of time in, in the American school system without it encouraging flourishing is what depresses me. It's also true it doesn't help people get jobs and it doesn't lead, make them more productive. But that's not, to me, the main thing. But on the socialist claim, which is mainly – and there's different flavors of it, of course. But one of the socialist claims is just pure material inequality. And it seems to me that that's pretty easy to fix. You don't need a lot of localized knowledge. You do need localized knowledge for what people really care about. You do need localized knowledge for what skills people need. But – Reading and writing, that's pretty basic. We don't do such a good job on that. So uh, yeah. while I accept the argument that uh, – the socialist argument that, that say public provision of schooling on an equality ba argument is, it ha is compelling. I don't agree that it should be publicly done, but I accept the logic of – within the logic of their own argument. But it's a failure. So, so to me, that suggests on purely practical grounds – forget the moral question for now – which I also agree with you on. But putting the moral question aside, the public schools are poorly run. They should be, to me, disbanded and replaced by private schools that are supported for charity and scholarships and other things using the low and designed by using local knowledge and what people really need, et cetera. So I totally agree with the thrust of your point. But it seems to me within the socialist agenda, pure redistribution of income is something government's very good at and has done fairly successfully. And if you asked how successful has it been? Does the purely redistributed part of government today have an impact? And I think it has a huge impact. And I think it's when you look at the studies that people have done of the – when you do pre versus post transfers of, of the distribution of income, it's significant. So I don't understand yeah. that second point that there's some uh, knowledge problem with redistributing income within the socialist agenda. It seems to me it's a straightforward thing. The U.S. government does it pretty well. European governments do it very well. They have they have definitely boosted up the bottom and created a safety net, financed mostly by people of higher income. And I don't like that because I rather – like you, I rather see it done privately. But it seems to be on its own terms. It's pretty successful. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to agree with your argument um, on its own terms. So if what we're measuring is uh, material equality or relative rates of material equality, yeah, that's pretty easy to do. Um, and it's pretty easy to set up a, a system of mechanisms, political mechanisms that will that will do that. Um, the larger question, I think, um, you, you put your finger on the right one, and that is to what end and to what effect? What exactly is the effect of doing that? Um, and the results are not all that good. So if the only thing you're measuring is um, do people have um, – is there greater inequality of wealth or less inequality of wealth? Well, that the state can manage. Um, but – it seems to me that that's a pretty poor proxy for the kinds of policies we should have in a humane and just society. What we want in a humane and just society is um, is what I what Aristotle called eudaimonia. This is the full flourishing of humanity, leading a life uh, well and truly lived with the cognizance of having done well, exploiting and exploring one's possibilities. Um, that's something that the state can't do, um, or at least has a much harder time doing. And if the only thing that were necessary for that were um, distribution of wealth, the redistribution of wealth, well, um, then the state would do it. Uh, but what we've seen in the United States and we've seen in Europe and elsewhere is that um, you, you, even if you have increasing levels of redistri redistribution of wealth, that doesn't mean that you have increasing levels of human flourishing. That doesn't follow. Um, now, some of the – you said the knowledge problem is not maybe as big a problem, at least at the fundamental level. So does everybody need to know how to read, write, and account, as Smith puts it? Um, uh, yeah, it seems like that's – those are some necessary – they're not sufficient, but they seem like they're necessary elements of uh, human flourishing. Well, it doesn't take very much to get a child to be able to read, write, and account. It certainly doesn't take 12 years of schooling for that. It would take a fraction of that. Um, but that – 
the, that's an element that's and, and so even on that fairly low level, we don't always uh, succeed very well um, in the public schooling system in the United States. Um, but even at that low threshold, um, that's not telling you any of the details of about what's required for any um, individual human being about um, what's required for leading a fully flourishing human life. And as you know, um, what we get in um, in uh, the United States um, through a lot of its social programs and a lot of what I would more generally call social inclined policy um, is an attempt not just to give a, a sort of floor below which no uh, uh, a minimum threshold below which no one will fall, but really to sort of capture and engineer a full life for people. Um, and a lot of what goes on in Washington today, where where all the action is, is um, not just um, what are the basic minimums, but instead, um, what are all the aspects of human life that we can engineer centrally so that we can ensure that human beings lead, lead the kind of lives we would like to lead? So it's a much more ambitious agenda than the one you were describing, and I think that's when the knowledge problem really comes to the fore. Well, you're, you're, you've opened up a not quite a Pandora's box, but you're, you're getting us toward the nanny state, which is something you, you – deal with in the book just in some detail um I, my inclination is to say that the glass right now is half full um i worry about the future of the nanny state i think at its current level it's it's fairly modest um you know it it uh it might keep me from getting a large soda in new york city it makes it hard for people to advertise cigarettes for me but this, the social engineering part of, of government is modest compared to what its potential could be. So, so I'm not quite as uh, worried, at least in the current at the current um, at the current level. But let me let me play G. A. Cohen for a sec. Wouldn't he respond to your point about about flourishing and uh, eudaimonia by saying, "Yeah, that's all true, but if you're hungry, you can't really flourish." So. If we if we could provide that minimum, which we, we don't exactly, we have this complex welfare system. It's uh, Europe is a better model, I think, for what GA Cohen's talking about. But wouldn't he argue that by removing the the worries of, of of hunger and giving people a basic level of income, it gives them a much better chance of of flourishing than the uh, than a, a more less fair model. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he would argue that, um, and. I think there's a lot to say about that. Um, first of all, um, to the question, which I think is implicit in what you're in what you're arguing, um, is wealth all that matters? And the answer to that is obviously no. Wealth is not the only thing that matters. But what wealth does do is it enables the things that do matter. So um, if I have to worry about whether my children can eat today, well, then I can't very well be spending time um, contemplating um, the highest good or what virtue is, et cetera, um, or um, contributing uh, – time, talent, and treasure to my church or other charities. I can't, I'm just worrying about, um, about feeding my children. Um, so a minimum, um, below a certain minimum level of wealth, um, none of these other questions matter. Um, now, if you take a bit of a historical perspective on uh, the human condition, not just as it appears today, but as it has appeared throughout uh, a, a longer stretch of human history, for the vast majority of recorded human history, the average person um, was quite poor. I mean, as Hobbes described uh, in the uh, in 1650 in the Leviathan, Hobbes said that the life of man was nasty, poor, brutish, and short. Well, in the 17th century and in basically everything up until the 17th century, he had that right. That was true. So um, it, it was a, in contemporary dollars, um, the average worldwide um, GDP, if you just take the, the total amount of uh, production of wealth and divide it by the number of people on the planet, it's something like one to three dollars per day that almost all human beings in human history lived on. At that level of, of wealth, which is really a level of poverty, um, there's not a whole lot of other things that people can worry about. That's all they're worried about. Um, but what happened historically is that around the 18th century or so, um, overall levels of wealth began to increase to the point where today we um, – the, worldwide, we enjoy unprecedented levels of wealth. Now, um, there, there are lots of interesting questions about that. What exactly caused it? Um, what could we do to maintain it? Um, and those are interesting questions. But in, um, the way they relate to um, the argument I think you're making is that um, once we once we begin to – rise out of, hist of humanity's historical norms of poverty, 
it's then that these kinds of questions about our obligations to one another really take force because now we're in a position to actually make a difference. And if you ask what is it that caused that rise in wealth, well, it wasn't redistribution of wealth. Um, so there's a lot of redistribution of wealth going on in all sorts of zero-sum ways throughout almost all of human history. And although the pharaoh in, uh, was wealthy and the uh, Roman emperor was wealthy and the, um, in the Song dynasty, the, emperor, the Chinese emperor was wealthy, um, everybody else wasn't. So what began to happen in the 18th century and moving forward in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century is that more and more of human exchange, um, human association, began to be informed with the Smithian model of – um, of understanding other people as peers and having the right to say, no, thank you. Um, and that's really what's transformed and enabled us to have the, the levels of wealth we have today. So now getting back down to brass tacks, um, if, if there's a child alive today, and there are many, maybe a, a billion or so um, in the world today that are still living at those historical norms, um, what's our, A, what's our obligation to them, and B, what's the best way to, um, to execute that obligation? Um, I think the obligation from, um, from us at a kind of institutional level is to figure out what the institutions are that have enabled the other six billion or so people to rise out of hu humanity's historical norms and to spread those institutions or figure out some kind of way to encourage the growth of those institutions in the other places that um, uh, are yet to enjoy their benefits. Um, and then on a personal level, I think it does place a personal obligation on us um, to help where we can. I mean, enjoying wealth is – the kinds of wealth that we in the United States enjoy today is far beyond what previous generations could even have imagined. Um, and that enables that, – that's not an end in itself, um, but that gives us all sorts of tools that we can use uh, to help others achieve similar levels so that they can begin to enjoy some of the good, good things in life that, are, that um, our wealth has enabled for us to achieve. Yeah, it's um... – for me, it's mostly a practical issue. You know, I don't, I just don't think we know how to help people very well. And it's possible, I'm, I'm not going to concede this, it's possible that helping itself is part of the problem. Obviously, giving people things is different from them earning them. And uh, I think that suggests that the ideal is to help people find ways to earn prosperity rather than to receive it from others. Um it's, and I think also, Russ, excuse me for interrupting. I, th I, I think that, um, that that's in large part, not exclusively, but in large part, an institutional question. Um, you know, I think sometimes we have, and this is part of what I in the book argue is is an aspect of the socialist inclined mindset, um, is that you have um, some people like us who have um, who enjoy who have who have been lucky enough to enjoy a, uh, the existence of certain institutions and have succeeded in them or living living a kind of life that. Um, as an a that is well above historical norms of poverty, um, but we think of other people who are still um, who are still at those historical norms as people who need us to do something for them. Um, oftentimes, I think that, that that's a dangerous mindset to have. One of the great insights that uh, that Smith brought to the fore right at the beginning of the Wealth of Nations was that um, no human beings are pretty much the same um, all the way around the world. Um, so, if you give them the opportunity. Um, and let them face the um, the rewards for success, and also the um, the um, face the consequences of making bad decisions. They figure out for themselves how to bit, how to better their own conditions. So a lot of times, um, I think you know the, the the socialist worldview thinks that there are some people who just can't figure it out for themselves, and we're going to have to do it for them. Um, and that I think is uh, is often not the case, and um, and maybe never the case, or almost never the case. Most people can figure out how to improve their own conditions if just given the right opportunity um, and allowed to do so. Yeah, I want to go to the G.A. Cohen uh, pick, uh, camping example. <clears throat> so G.A. Cohen tells the story of a camping trip where we take a bunch of stuff, all kinds of gear and food, and we load it up in our cars and we head off into the wilderness. And the idea is we're going to have a, um, we're going to have a little vacation together. There's going to be a lot of community. We're going to do a bunch of stuff together. We might go hiking together. We might cook together. Uh, we're with a bunch of friends, and it's a very idyllic uh, image that he that he conveys. And then he talks about how unpleasant that trip would be if we used the capitalist norms that um, that we're accustomed to. So he suggests that if one of the members of the party 
uh, knows about, say, a, a special source of water in the, on the in the wilderness that uh, his father had told him about, and he proceeds then to offer to sell it to the other people because his father had endowed him with this knowledge, people would be offended. Right. He, he talks about somebody's a better fisherman than the others, so he decides he wants the better tasting fish. He wants to make the other people eat the, the less tasty fish because, after all, he caught them. Um, right. And he has a couple other examples. These are all um, – it's it's a very clever example, and it taps into uh, a deep emotional – uh, response that we'd have that we would not want to go on a on a trip with those folks mostly uh, most of the time, or the right. or the person who's say the best cook of the group who decides to 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 sell his services to the rest of the group. So um, what's wrong with Jay Cohen? What's wrong with that example? Um, well, there are a couple of things. I mean, um, just on its own terms, it's a bit of a uh, it, it's it's a highly stylized um, scenario. Let's put uh, put it that way. I mean, there are all sorts of restrictions and assumptions built into it. Um, I mean, f- for w- which are instructive. Um, first of all, uh, and he concedes that, by the way, to be fair to him, right? <laughs> yes, um, but but they still have to be explored. Yeah. Um, so, for for example, um, all of the things that we bring with us to the camping trip, those just sort of appeared out of nowhere. Um, so there's no sense of those having to have been produced or traded for, exchanged, created. Um, the various levels, this is the, the tents and the, um, and all the tools, pots and pans, all these things he described. So those just came out of nowhere, but okay, we can concede that to him. Um, but, uh, more instructive or more important, I think is, um, the idea that, well, there's a fairly narrow range of purposes that people have on a camping trip. So, um, you have a small, a relatively small number of people, um, uh, all of whom either know each other in advance or are going to get to know each other very soon because very quickly because they're all um, together in this joint project. But the sense of a single joint project or um, with with a single one or two purposes up for the joint project for a limited duration, camping trips don't go forever. They go for you know a weekend or something or maybe a week um, at most. If you're bringing your kids and your family, it's not probably not going to be more than a week. Um, that's a very stylized um, kind of scenario and a very, a very unusual scenario. So what, what I, we might be willing to say to Cohen is, you know, if you had that kind of scenario, yeah, maybe you're right. That's the best way, or at least that's arguably a way to organize um, a camping trip. The problem is a society is not like that um, scenario because what we have in a country like the United States with over 300 million people, we don't have people who know each other we don't have people who all have the same schedule of value and the same hierarchy of purpose. We don't have the ability to um, look each other fit literally in the eyes and, um, and say, well, do you mind if my kid uh, rides your kid's bicycle for half an hour or not? We, we can't do those things on a larger scale. And it's not just that, um, that um, scale makes things more difficult. It's that once you get, out, get above a very small group, that kind of scenario is just no longer possible. We have to find alternative ways of associating with one another, of exchanging, trading, partnering, and relying on that kind of um, deep personalized knowledge where you actually look each other in the eye is simply not going to be transferable to a large scale society. So what's, I mean, maybe a, a, another way of looking at that, at that is, um, you know, look at a, a typical family or sort of the stereotypical family where you have parents and kids Would you want within that family, in that household, would you want people um, bidding and offering and making exchanges for, you know, I'll charge you this much to sit on the couch, et cetera, and this is my my half of the room and you got to get a ticket to come into my half of the room or something? No, no, that's absolutely not going to work. Um, But what works in a family or in a very small community is not necessarily something that's transferable to a larger community. In fact, um, I think it's pretty demonstrable that it won't work. Um, the only way you would be able to get that kind of cooperation is if you completely regiment regiment the entire society along the line, say, of a military or something, where you have some clear leaders who give orders and everybody else just follows them. Um, and in fact, that's actually the historical pattern that socialist um, communities have, have taken. Um, they start out, or um, they can often start out as small communities, um, but if it's more than just people in a family or a very small group, well, you're, they're going to become regimented very quickly. Um, and uh, the, the trade-offs you will then begin to see, um, the, the foregone prosperity, the foregone wealth, the foregone innovation, entrepreneurship, 
um, and ultimately prosperity is exactly the pattern that um, socialist communities have taken. Yeah, so I, I was fascinated by this, and I and I think I, I want to talk about. I'll go back to the quote that Cohen had earlier. Um, I serve you not because of what I can get in return by doing so, but because you need or want my service, and you, for the same reason, serve me. Now, I have to confess – I don't have to confess that I'm proud of it actually. Uh, I mean that's how I teach my children to behave toward each other. Yeah. And I would argue that – and I've mentioned it many times on this program, I think. Uh, you know, Walter Williams points out that, that a family is a socialist enterprise. It's top down. The parents, sometimes the mother, sometimes the father, sometimes they act, they act in concert, but they run the lives of the children to a large extent up to a certain point, a certain right. age – and I would argue that it's not – and this is where I'm trying to give Cohen his due, and uh, I'm, I'm bending over backwards here to give socialism its due. I think the – I think it's not just that uh, the family works better when I just say uh, to one of my children, well, you get the last piece of chicken instead of auctioning it off, right? Uh, an example I've used before. So I don't auction off the last piece of chicken. I don't auction off the bedrooms. I don't give the kids points or allowances and let them bid on these different things and allocate right. – their incomes accordingly to their own preferences. I decide who gets what room. Uh, for a while, two of my sons room together, and then eventually one got their own room. Yeah. Uh, so I make those are those are made by fiat by by my wife and myself. And right. um, it's n one argument is yeah, it works better because there's lower transaction costs if you had to do the bidding and keeping track of the money and all that. But I think that's the wrong argument. I think the reason we run our families that way is because it's better, not on efficiency grounds, because it's more rewarding. It's more pleasant. It's more – there's something deep inside us that wants to live that way. And I think Cohen's problem uh, – and this is a Hayekian insight from The Fatal Conceit – Cohen's problem is that that really nice urge, which works great in a family and works usually pretty well in a camping trip, although some camping trips, as some families, end with squabbling and in and, and disarray. But right. extending them to a large area, it, there's – it's a lovely idea. It's just it's not. It doesn't work. In fact, it's, it's more a than romantic it does. ideal. And you know, it has. That but it's has a good ideal. I, 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 I want to see if yeah. you agree with me that it is a good ideal, even though we don't. And so we do feel uncomfortable that that people have certain advantages, say, which Cohen points out in the camping trip that they're able to exploit. We might decide that we shouldn't let the state enforce uh, reduce those advantages, but the idea that. The emotional response that, that the camping trip example provides, I think, really explains why we're so deeply attracted to the socialist inclination. Yeah, and that, and that is the Hayekian point. We, I mean, we are a small group species, and we developed certain psychological and social instincts that have served us well in our evolutionary history, um, which was largely a very small group um, evolutionary history. The groups of humans that survived were the ones that had a very small but um, extremely cohesive and also in many ways an equal um, um, status in the community or, may, or um, more along the lines of what you were describing about the socialist family. You had a leader, um, but wealth and resources were tended to be shared very within very small margins. Um, and those instincts we, we carry with us today. I mean, but I do want to I'm, I'm going to um, part with you on one aspect of that. So you asked, is that is that a kind of a good ideal? Um, it, it certainly has captured and continues to capture. I think it resonates with us on a deep and almost psychological level. Um, and that's been um, present throughout a lot of recorded human history. People have talked about golden ages where um, uh, where human beings existed in these kind of spontaneously harmonious small groups where everybody's needs were met and. Nobody had very much more than anybody else, and people spontaneously wanted to serve, to, to give to one another only because the other needed it, and, and in order to, in other words, to serve one another. Um, and that's a very powerful idea. Uh, but that works in the family. I think the reason that works in the family is not only because it's a small group, although that's one big part of it, but a, another reason is that children aren't yet fully, fully adults. And that's a very important distinction. So one reason why we think it's appropriate for right parents to establish, um, you know, the overall mission and purpose of their lives as a, uh, as a family is because um, the children aren't yet equipped to do that. You know, you mentioned almost fleetingly, fleetingly you said, well, um, you know, the, the children, the, the adults make the decisions um, up to a certain point. Precisely right. 
um, at a certain point, what we do is we recognize that our children are now transitioning into becoming adults. And at that point, their lives become their own. They are now the captains and authors of their own lives with all the good and bad that comes with it. They are free to make decisions for themselves and also accountable to be held um, responsible for those decisions. So the argument that I make in the book about um, socialism and capitalism, part of it hinges on this distinction between being a child and being an adult. The socialist model, I think, um, is exactly captured by this idea that there are some adults in the room who need to run the, uh, who need to run the show for the children. And it takes that model of, of differential hierarchy and applies it to all of society. And what I say is, well, hold the horses for a second, because um, in society in general, what we're talking about is millions of adults who are not only capable, but who are morally, I think, responsible for their own lives. Um, not one group of people who knows how to run a life and then a bunch of people who are incompetent. Um, and I think that's precisely the, the, the aspect of the argument that we miss. That, that, that holds for a family, and that's why we think it's right. The parents, yeah, you, you decide who gets the chicken and who doesn't get the chicken. Um, but in a larger society um, that's made up of competent adults, free people, um, let them – the same amount of authority that the parent assumes on, their, uh, on his or her own behalf – is exactly the same amount of freedom and authority and responsibility that we should grant to all of the other um, normally functioning adults in society, which is almost everybody else in society. That's a great point. And I, I actually have – it reminds me of a different problem with my point. So I'm gonna, let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me critique my point in a different way, which is what I thought you were going to say, which is that it's not just a small group. Uh, and it's not just a small group of, of adults and children. It, it's a small group of people who have chosen – to care about each other. So my wife and I aren't just thrown randomly together. We, we, we fell in love yeah. and chose to get married. Uh, right. We care deeply about our children. So it's true we don't know exactly what they're thinking, and we, of course, may make mistakes in thinking about what's best for them. But we clearly are, are – our interests are very much aligned through emotional and genetic ways. Um, if you take the next level up, which is the camping trip or the kibbutz, an example you use in your – in, in your book a few times, uh, mm -hmm. kibbutzim, kibbutzes struggle. They, they're, they're not – it's not clear they're a successful model even though they're a small group because right. it's very hard for people to make those decisions to share and be egalitarian in a, in a, in a setting where they don't love each other. Uh, it's much easier for me to tell my son – don't exploit your younger brother when you swap that baseball card, which I do, by the way. <laughs> my, old, my oldest son, when he was younger, unfortunately, would often try to get a good deal. Uh, yeah. And my youngest son, who was ignorant, you know, there's what we, there was an asymmetric information problem, quote, market failure in the language of the – of uh, That's why we don't allow a market there. Yeah, and I, so I don't. I just you – know, I'd stop it. I, 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 I was the commissioner. Eventually, I, I was the – I had to approve all trades of cards uh, to defend the interests of my youngest – uh, uninformed, often uninformed son, because they wanted to look back later and realize he'd been taken advantage of. And I wanted my older son to take that into account when he proposed trades. Uh, but doing that with uh, people you do not love, don't have a family connection with, is is much more challenging. And certainly, as it gets larger, yeah. uh, it gets it gets increasingly difficult. Um, and if you don't have a stake in the outcome, I mean, in in, in a family, you have a a biological, psychological, emotional stake in the outcome of, of your children's lives. Um, and for people who don't know each other and uh, take any two random people in the United States, they don't have a similar sort of stake in one another's, uh, in one another's uh, outcomes of their lives. So you just can't uh, rely on the same kinds of motivations. Yeah, I just uh, – it, it's a it, – you could argue it's an ideal that such a person would want to serve a stranger – for what the stranger needs, but to count on that seems like a, a, a model that certainly Adam Smith would not uh, would not agree with, um, because he understood that that love falls off as distance increases. Um, uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about Smith. You talk about Smith's ideal vision for the role of the state. What is it? Well, um, he says peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. Um, which is uh, not much. So, um, you know, Smith was not a, what I would call an a prioriist philosopher. So he was not like John Locke, say, trying to deduce the 
the, the, the principles of government from natural law. He was an empirical, more pragmatic um, uh, investigator. Let's look and see what kinds of societies um, succeed and what kinds of societies don't. And the conclusion he reached um, on an inductive basis, looking um, throughout, through history and data, the data he was able to assemble, suggested to him that, what, um, that first of all, you did need a government, um, but it, it had only a few duties. Um, so it needed to um, it needed to provide for protection against foreign invasion. So that's something like an army. Um, it needed also to protect citizens against um, aggression from their fellow citizens. So it needed something like a police and a court system to adjudicate disputes. Um, and then Smith had his third category, which is a bit more amorphous. He said there are certain public works that he thought the government could also be justified in providing. Um, but they had to meet two criteria, and they're actually surprisingly stringent criteria. The two criteria something would need to meet in order to be justified as uh, for public provision were, first of all, it had to benefit the entire great society, as he said, not just one group of people at the expense of another. And second, it had to be something that couldn't be provided by private enterprise, that private enterprise couldn't, um, couldn't um, get a profit for providing it. Um, and now, you know, what falls into that third category is uh, a matter of some dispute and maybe even speculation. Uh, but he thought it was things like um, elementary education, uh, maybe ro roads, uh, bridges, canals, so infrastructure, things Sewage, like that. Sewage, if he had some. Yeah, so, you know, and maybe some aspects of public health. Yeah. Um, so, um, so he was not an anarchist. Um, he was not even uh, maybe, a, if you like, an, a, a Randian, Ayn Randian, um, um, limited, almost limited to zero government sort of person. That's not him. Um, he was willing to allow for there to be some flexibility. But the way I think it, it, was, a, it was a small government, um, but in the few things that the government did, he thought it should be, it, it should be have the powers and, uh, and be robust enough to actually satisfy those particular goals that it, that it, that it should rightly have. So what was his, what would you say his view on redistribution was? Because um, people have made claims for him. Um, so I'd like to hear it from, you're closer to the horse's mouth in my mind than others. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think redistribution for the sake of redistribution um, would have been alien to him. He was interested in, in endorsing the institutions that allowed people to better their own conditions. Um, that's his phrase, but, you know, the, better their own conditions. So Smith had actually a, a really a, a, a robust, large faith in that people, if given the opportunity, are um, are a, would be able to figure out what would actually constitute bettering their own condition and to figure out ways to improve their condition. He just needed to give them the institutional security to enable to give them that opportunity. Um, so uh, there's a whole lot of what goes on today in in the, under the name of redistribution that I think Smith would have thought um, is. I could either be counterproductive, and although that's an empirical matter, um, but that in many ways is just unnecessary. Once you secure basic um, protections of life, liberty, uh, property, and contract, voluntary contract or voluntary promise, um, then that, that gives people the conditions they need in order to flourish all on their own. So let me um, step away from this, these issues of, of equality and socialism just for a sec because you've, you've – uh raised an interesting um, side note here I want to get into, which is uh, you and I have talked, I think, about this before, and uh, I've talked about it recently in, in some Econ Talk episodes related to my recent book. But one of the interesting questions is you said people would better themselves, and I'm thinking, yeah, Smith talks about the, the propensity to truck barter in exchange, which is a, definitely an urge to get a better deal, to find something, an improvement. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating to me that Smith in, in The Wealth of Nations is, is focused on material prosperity, more or less. There's human flourishing in there, but he's also worrying about starving to death versus not. Um, right. in, in the theory of moral sentiments, he's very discouraging of the urge to better yourself um, in, the, in the material sense. He, of course, says man naturally desires not only to be loved and to be lovely, and by loved he means – respected, admired, paid attention to, praised. And he says the wrong way to do that is to make money. And we have this impulse to do that because rich people get more attention than poor people. And poor people are pitiful because no one pays any attention to them, says right. Smith. And so I just, it's, um, 
it, it raises the question whether Smith w- would accept this idea that, that people won't even get better off or whether it's even worth doing. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It, th- that's a complex question with a lot of different parts. I mean, it sounds like a simple question or a simple issue, but it really isn't. Um, I mean, it goes back in some ways to something we talked about um, at the beginning of our conversation, um, which is that, you know, if there are people who aren't sure whether they can eat or whether they can feed their children today, whose children are um, actually in danger of starving, well, then none of the rest of this really matters. Um, th- that's what matters. Um, but once you reach a certain threshold, which is actually pr- pretty low by, by uh, contemporary Western standards. And in Smithian certain, standards, very low. <laughs> and, yeah, and by Smithian standards, extremely low. So, you know, but once you re- pass that, um, that standard, um, a potential danger, and I think this is what Smith was trying to envision. I mean, remember, he was writing at the cusp of commercial society. So, you know, he, he, had, he could have had no idea about the what kinds of things markets could produce or a market-based society could produce. There's no way he or anybody else could have had any idea. But one of the things I think he may have been worried about is that um, in a commercial society, that could generate the wealth that would enable people to ascend above this threshold, whatever that minimum threshold is, they can ascend above the threshold, which would have the the, the great good benefit for humanity that a, um, they're no longer worried um, on a day-to-day basis, can I eat today? Um, and this would be true for their children. <clears throat> and it would also then um, enable other kind, them to turn their attention to other kinds of things that could actually call forth um, the powers and the imagination of, um, of human beings that otherwise would have just left, um, f- been left fallow because they couldn't um, exploit those, uh, lo- those higher powers in, in, in the service of higher uh, ends. On the other hand, there is the worry that if you have a commercial society, people can begin to become, I think he was worried, um, they can be, they can be confused about what the actual goals of the society are. And what I mean by that is they begin to think, um, that the generation of wealth can become an end in itself and that having the wealth is already everything you need to have to be happy, to be a fully flourishing, um, eudaimonic, uh, or have a fully flourishing eudaimonic life. And Smith thought that was a mistake. That would be a mistake, and I think he's right about that. That that is a mistake, um, and I think he thought that that was a worry um, and a potential danger. Now he thought it was worth the bargain. That um, it was bringing people out of those historical norms of poverty was worth running this risk. But nevertheless, it was a risk that people would begin to conflate wealth with happiness. So instead of seeing wealth as a tool to enable them to achieve and others around them to achieve what um, true happiness might be that it could stand as the, um, in place of the happiness itself. And that was a real worry. And, um, and you know, I think that brings us back to an, another aspect of our conversation that we've already had, which is education. What becomes the goal of education then? Well, part of the goal of education is not just teaching each new generation as they come along about what the institutions are that enable wealth generation, but also what the components of a life well-lived really are. Um, and the relation between those two. So education then can um, can really take on a much more deeper and more important um, role in human society once we've reached a certain level of wealth. Yeah, it's ironic, I think, that our university level education, at least and to some extent, our K through 12 has become increasingly focused on the job market as opposed to a life well lived, which... Um, it's easy to get in a soapbox about that. I'm not going to do that right this second, but I think. Well, it's, I, it's a confusion <laughs> of, of what's necessary for what's sufficient. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's like asking, you know, what's the purpose of, a, of a, a firm or a business? Is it to make a profit? Well, that's necessary for the su- success of a firm, um, but that's certainly not sufficient for why we should want to have firms in the world. And I think it's similar to um, the, um, the institutions that enable wealth generation, that's necessary for leading um, a flourishing life, but it's certainly not sufficient. So I want to close with a, an observation you make that I found quite striking. Um, you're talking about the contrast between uh, the socialist emphasis on, the, on classes, different types of individuals versus the capitalist focus on the individual, uh, him or herself, and the importance of the individual. Uh, and you write the following – I argue that it has, in fact, been one of the great triumphs of human civilization to conceive of human beings not as members of classes but as individual and unique centers of moral agency. It is that which has enabled the moral principle that each of us possesses a unique dignity that demands respect. That single, simple insight, individual dignity demanding respect, 
is what has enabled us to condemn humanity's formerly ubiquitous slavery, to condemn genocide and ethnic cleansing, and to work out endorse a notion of universal human rights. We should not underestimate the transformative and epical significance of that, nor the dangers attendant on weakening our commitment to it. So why don't you close, end of quote, so why don't you close us out and talk about the, the social, socialist impulse to think about classes versus the capitalist uh, focus on the individual and, and why, that, why that's such an important – why do you make that distinction as one of the important ones between the two and then come back to your, your conclusion? Well, I think that's really um, one of the central parts of the moral argument against socialism and in favor of um, this decentralized um, notion of capitalism. Um, I mean, once you start thinking about human beings as members of classes, so um, even if it's classes that sound initially plausible or um, or uh, neutral, like the rich and the poor, um, well, immediately what you begin to do is to see human beings in those within those classes as being more or less interchangeable. They're like marbles or poker chips, and one is just as good as another. Um, but once the, the danger that has actually um, issued in, in, in uh, real um, horrible consequences in human history is that once you begin to see um, people as being interchangeable, at least among classes, this race, this, um, this religion, this nationality, this ethnicity, um, then you begin to dehumanize them. They don't, they're no longer, they don't seem to you like individual centers of human dignity. And I think um, looking at a lot of the, the horrible episodes of human history, that's what you see. You see one group of people um, looking at another group of people as mere uh, members of a group, mere members of a class. Um, but by contrast, when you see instead uh, human beings as being individuals, which, by the way, I think is the, is the correct way to view them, individual centers of human agency, individual centers of human dignity, um, that completely transforms our relationship to one another. Um, so I, I don't, I'd no longer view you as interchangeable, as fungible, as a poker chip. I view you as an irreplaceable and precious asset, a precious commodity, a precious human being. Something that brings something to someone who brings something to the world that nobody else ever has or nobody in the future ever will. That completely transforms um, our relationship to one another. And I think that's captured by the individualism that you see in capitalism. That what we do is we see people, all people, any person, as being um, as being unique, having dignity, and being uniquely precious in this in exactly this way. And when we see it that way. Um, then this is what I think is what I call this, this, this triumph of human moral agency. That's really, that's really a transformation in how we view other people. That is what will, um, will debar us from um, labeling a, whole, uh, a population of people as um, a certain kind of group and then devaluing them because they're in the wrong kind of group. We can't do that because each member of that group is unique. Each member is different from all of the others, and each one of them is irreplaceable. My guest today has been Jim Otteson. His book is The End of Socialism. Jim, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much, Russ. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.